my gosh, I'm so happy to be here. Um, and I'm so happy to see all these faces, oh, all these faces that I know. Um, oh my gosh, it just feels great to be here. Two weeks ago was the official book release of The Winter Bees. So it's still super, super fresh. This is my first gig uh, post release. So I'm really happy to be back here uh, in New Ulm to, to share some stories with you. If you're from around the area, um, or actually like we were just saying, from Minnesota, anywhere really, uh, you will probably recognize some people in the stories, some places, um, ways of speaking, ways of interacting with one another. Um, and well, I hope you do, because if you do, then I've done my job the right way. So um, yeah, what I'm gonna do tonight is I'm gonna read um, a few excerpts from different stories. The Winter Bees is a collection of 10 short stories that are intertwined. And by that, I mean that there are characters that recur in these stories. Um, one character in particular, Anna Zins, um, is a bartender and a saloon owner. She shows up in, I think, three or four of the, of the 10 stories. Um, setting kind of holds all these stories together. It's a fictionalized version of New Ulm. Um, I figured this town is such a character in itself, you know, why mess with it? Just use it as it is and uh, fictionalize it a little bit. Um, and by fictionalizing, what I've done is sometimes if uh, buildings or businesses weren't in existence at a certain time, you know, I can play with the timing. So, you know, maybe I need George's Ballroom to be there at, you know, in the 1910s. You know, it wasn't, but I can do that in fiction because it's not, um, I'm not beholden to the truth. That's the wonderful thing about fiction. You can just make it all up. Um, <laughs> So I will, uh, I'll start out, I'll just read um, from the first story, which is called Last Call. And this was uh, the oldest, this is the oldest story in the collection. Um, I wrote it 20 years ago. So this has been a long time coming, this book. Um, but dreams do come true. It was published in Minnesota Monthly in uh, 1998. And um, it kind of set the stage for the other nine stories in here. So um, I'm just gonna read that first. Anna poked her head out the front door, looked up and down the snowy street before shutting off the lights. She locked the saloon climbed the warp back stairs to her apartment one step at a time. He hadn't shown up tonight, even though yesterday he told her that he liked sauerkraut and pork meatloaf, and certainly he couldn't turn down a fundraiser for a good cause, especially if it meant cold beer, old time music, and the chance to share some eats with a good looking woman. Anna had been rubbing lotion into her elbows and forearms the first time he walked into the joint, a dead Saturday afternoon. He tipped his cap to her and smiled, settled onto the middle stool. Grüß Gott, he said. Got any Hounstein? His double chin bounced when he spoke, like some unsupported breast. Ja, natürlich, Anna said. She wiped her hands on her apron, pulled a bottle out of the cooler, and pried off the top. He rubbed his knuckles, kneaded them warm. Scheiße, es ist kalt, nicht wahr? Cold, huh? Guy shouldn't be out in this weather. In her head, Anna quickly ticked through the possibilities. Traveling salesman? Visiting grandpa. A simple man without a map? Yeah, supposed to snow more too, she said. The whole southern Minnesota is in some sort of watch or something till 10 o'clock. She tossed a coaster onto the bar before setting down his beer. Looks like we're right in the middle of it all. Montevideo, clear down to Alberly. The jowly old man took a large swallow and extended his freckled hand. Lloyd Vogel. Anna, she said, then squeezed more lotion onto her arm. After a few careful circles, she looked back at the black and white football game playing above the bar. Lawn nights tending, mixing drinks stiff to speed the clock, had pulled her face down and cut deep lines around her eyes and mouth. 
She wore red lipstick, Woolworth's best 40 years ago. The gray knot of hair atop her head stood firm, severe as a fist. At the commercial, she dug out a Kleenex from inside her rolled sleeve and blew her nose. She noticed Lloyd staring at her elbows or her low breasts. She wasn't sure which. <laughs> Anna tucked the tissue back up her sleeve. I got psoriasis, she said. She wiped down the bar in front of Lloyd, talked to the wood. And so I sent for this special lotion off the TV, supposed to make it go away, but ugh, I don't think it's doing a damn thing. She set aside the rag and folded her arms, picked at the softened pink scabs. The cooler motor kicked in. Say, were you a movie star? Lloyd asked. His eyes narrowed. Cause I know I seen you before, many years ago. Anna shook her head. You look like Betty Davis, he continued. Like you should have your name in lights. You've got Hollywood lips. He brought his fingers to his mouth and blew Anna a kiss. She took a step back and scratched the underside of her arm, then looked up at the TV screen. Players lined up along the 35. No, she said, but I wanted to be. I could have been. Lloyd followed her eyes up to the game. A lawn dancing quarterback, an incomplete pass, and on jog the special teams unit. Well, you're certainly pretty enough now, he said, and I bet back then you was some looker, had all the men begging. Lloyd finished his beer, winked, and asked for another. Anna smiled. The gold hooks of her partial flashed in the saloon's neon glow. He showed up again the next afternoon. Anna shook a bucket of ice cubes into the bin behind the bar, plucked a few stray cubes off the floor mat, and dropped them into the sink. I had my portrait painted by a famous artist, she told Lloyd. Walter Eisenbauer said it turned out so good, he was going to show it in New York City, said I was a natural model. She filled a green plastic bowl with beer nuts and slid it next to Lloyd's bottle of 3-2. I'll maybe show it to you sometime. I got it upstairs, over the TV. I live up there, you know. The bell over the front door jingled. Two regulars ordered the usual and hoisted themselves onto a pair of stools at the far end of the bar. Anna snapped off the bottle caps, adjusted her glasses on the tip of her nose, and counted out 50 pull tabs. Lloyd tapped his finger on the wood in time with her count. So, what happened? He asked. You got married instead? Had the babies? Anna turned the channel from an infomercial to bowling. One of the regulars thanked her. She took a swig from her own bottle of beer. Someone had to take care of Ma, she told Lloyd. Pa died, Johnny died, someone had to run the place. Lloyd looked over his shoulder, down the length of the bar, the back bar, into the grill area, Anna's face. You're the only one that works here then? Anna nodded. Yeah, 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 lived here my whole life. Ma died just last year. She took another sip and pointed toward the tin ceiling with the bottle. I got squirrels upstairs, mean ones. I hear them up in the attic making nests or something, looking for something to eat. Lloyd leaned forward and lowered his voice. Best way to get rid of them is to be nice to them, he said. Coax them out with a piece of good food. Hello, my little squirrel friend. Then pow, all done, fertig. He scooped a handful of nuts, chewed with his mouth open. Anna laughed. Catch them off guard, you mean, when they don't suspect a thing. You sure are a sly one, Gil. Yeah. <clears throat> so a lot of my stories are um, set in Anna's saloon. Um, and what I love about setting stories in a bar is that absolutely anybody can walk in. Absolutely anybody. Um, and then you add a little booze into the mix and people will say anything and do anything. And uh, so there's just tons of possibilities when you're, when you're setting a story in a, in a bar. So 
That's why a lot of mine um, are there. Um, the characters that I, that I have in my stories, um, there's a, a YA author named Chris Crutcher. And he was asked the question where he gets his characters from. And so I kind of borrowed his answer and um, paraphrasing here, but he says that all of his characters are based on real people. You know, some part of a real person sparks this character because he said he doesn't have the imagination to come up with a character completely from scratch. And that's exactly the way I feel as well. Um, so what I like to do is, is if someone has a, is a peculiar hobby or maybe they have a certain look or a certain speech pattern, I will borrow that and mix all these pieces together to kind of create mosaics. Um, so all of my characters have probably six different real people put into them. Um, there's one character in particular in this, in this collection who's very closely based on a real person, and that was my great aunt. Um, and she did own a saloon. For those of you who are from New Ulm, um, she owned Cults' Corner, which is actually just right across the street. Um, so it feels really cool to be reading these stories just right across the street from uh, the setting of, of so many of these. Um, she's probably the character that's closest to a real person. Um, but everyone else, you know, um, like I said, they're, they're mosaics. Um, and I'm sure there's a little piece of me in probably every character uh, as well. So um, I'm going to read you another excerpt. Um, this is from a story called Schultz. And um, uh, again, we start out in on a saloon. Marty Schultz is kind of the um, male version of Anna Zins. She, or he also grew up in New Ulm and, and never left. He's kind of a handyman, um, jack of all trades kind of person. And he's always hanging out at Anna's saloon. And he also um, helps out as a maintenance man down at George's ballroom. So this is from the beginning of Schultz. Some men know cars, others know football. Baseball. What type of bait is sure to snag a pan-sized walleye? Marty Schultz knew fire. Even though he'd never been a fireman himself, he knew all the volunteers in town and who their folks had been, who was always first on a call, what equipment they used, how many elevators, barns, and trailers had been eaten by fire in Brown County over the past 12 months, and, of course, who torched them. He gleaned nuggets of information from his police scanner at home or a few well-placed calls to retired firemen, and he delighted in sharing the news with the other old regulars at Anna's saloon. Say, Marty said, hoisting himself onto a red vinyl stool. Hear about Fisher's boy? Anna hooked a bottle of shells under the edge of the counter for him, snapped off the cap. Marty was always her first customer of the day, smart in his pressed blue dickies. Anna shook her head and wiped her hands on her apron. Said another one? Mm-hmm. Let his car's wife lit his wife's car up like a bonfire last night. One of them Mazel Tov cocktails right through the window. Of course, they ain't got no proof yet that it's him. Marty took a swallow. Think she's getting more than ground beef and brats from city meats, if you know what I mean. Figures that butcher, George Reuger's kid Brian, is slipping her the sausage special. <laughs> Anna turned the volume down on the TV and up on the radio. Mid-morning meant KNUJ's regional obituaries, followed by a 15-minute cooking show. Today's topic was holiday hot dishes. I'd like to make something special for the Christmas Eve party tomorrow, Anna said. I found a recipe for lime-flavored Knox blocks. I bet a guy could use a cookie cutter to cut them into Christmas trees instead of squares. Something kind of different. <clears throat> Marty rustled through the morning papers and hummed. Anna grabbed a few lemons from a wire basket on the back bar. And it's Molotov, not Mazel Tov. Whatever, Marty mumbled. The saloon brightened as Anna sliced neat wedges and wheels for the garnish can caddy. Yeah, I heard the sirens last night around, ah, couldn't have been earlier than midnight, I guess, one o'clock. 
Me and you did the right thing, Anna, Marty said, scanning football stacks. Didn't get mixed up in that whole marriage business. Think of all the messes we saved ourselves from, boy, I tell you. The radio woman rattled off a list of people who had passed away in the last day or two, visitation hours, and where the burial was, in the same carnival barker way she announced meat specials at the local grocer. Alphonse Bushard, 92, died last night at Loretta Hospital. He survived by his wife, Mary, 10 grandchildren, and many great-grandchildren. Pick up a pound of ground chuck, 90 cents this week only at your neighborhood Red Owl store, the store for value. This weather, Anna began, honest to God, it's killing people left and right. It's getting so a guy doesn't know who's dead and who you just haven't seen in a while. <laughs> just then the radio burst into the Lichtensteiner polka, signaling the start of Adeline's Eats. The radio woman, Adeline Meyer, now finished with her list of the dead, barked her way through three holiday hot dish recipes. The polka looped continuously in the background. She sure knows how to get people's attention, Anna said. I'll give her that. We went to school together, you know, up at Trinity. She was our class valedictorian. Two cans cream of mushroom soup and two cans peas. Anna tapped her pencil to the bouncy music and scribbled part of a recipe in between measures. She was a smart one but kind of loose, too. Hmm? Yep. <laughs> like I said, you will recognize people if you're from around here. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Um, so um, I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit in the story. Like I said, Marty also is kind of a handyman at George's Ballroom. And um, so this is kind of just a, a little bit of a flashback going back to one of the reasons why George's Ballroom holds such a special place in Marty's heart. Um, this was the first, the first reason that uh, he came to love the place. George's ballroom was as much a part of Marty as his old bones. It warmed his blood and felt like home. Its neon face and smoky voice had teased him since 1948 when he had slow danced with his first love, Agnes Brandle, out on its shiny wooden floor. The Brandles had farmed a few miles outside town, out near Klossner a blink of a village with a post office and grain elevator on one side of the road and a bar sticky with disappointment on the other. Brandel's place was a modest setup, a small coop of chickens, a few horses and cows, a couple dogs, cats, and a house stuffed to the beams with children. Marty had always felt a connection with Agnes, even though he'd been a townie himself. Whenever the other kids in class had refused to sit by her because she smelled of horse, Marty had slid his chair close, shared the jelly sandwich his mother had packed for him, and kept Agnes from tears. The day he had asked her to the Valentine's Day dance at George's ballroom, she had paled, her eyes wide and wide and wild. He'd seen that look before on his uncle's cows when the dogs danced too close around their legs. She stammered something about chores and having nothing nice enough to wear and then bolted down the front steps of the school, leaving behind a trail of pencils and bread crust. Although he was only 14 years old and didn't know much of anything about girls, Marty understood that her answer was a firm no. But that night, as he sat along the edge of the dance floor with the other boys, staring across the abyss at the girls, chaperones swimming from side to side, trying desperately to bring the two groups together, in walked Agnes Brandle and her older brother, Frank. Marty would later claim that all the other children dissipated like steam when her curled red hair, pulled back by a blue bow, charged the air in the room. 
She wore a blue and white checkered cotton dress beneath her wool coat, knee-high boots with a narrow fur fringe, the pair she most likely wore only to Sunday church. Her brother swung her black shoes, their laces tied to one another by his little finger. Some of the girls snickered, whispered not so quietly about how old Agnes's dress was and how many times they'd seen her wear it. But Marty didn't see the frayed hem, faded color, or how her sleeves stopped short halfway between her wrists and elbows. To him, Agnes was an enchanting blue flame. She scanned the room and Marty tried to catch her eye with a little wave. Frank chucked his sister lightly on the shoulder and then headed over to the bar. Marty could feel the panic rise from the soles of Agnes's feet, climb up her neck, flushing her cheeks and making her eyes water. He half walked, half ran over to her, afraid she'd bolt again if he didn't act quickly. Hey, Marty said, didn't think you was coming. Sure glad you did though, you look real nice. Agnes didn't say anything, and the space between them grew thick. Marty scratched the back of his neck and cleared his throat once, then again. Got a haircut a couple days ago, and it's already growing back itchy, he laughed. Yours probably don't do that, though, huh? For girls, it's probably different. Agnes, who'd been staring at the middle of Marty's chest as he spoke, finally looked up into his face and bit her lower lip. Marty knew if she cried, it'd be all over, so he reached for her hands. Hey, come on, he said just under his breath. Tell you what, just stay for a little while, just try it. And then if you still hate it and want to leave, I'll walk you out, okay? Okay, Agnes said. So they stood alongside each other for a long time, glasses of punch cupped in their hands, watching couples slowly venture out into the deep water, chaperones encouraging them in their wake. Eventually, Marty and Agnes were swept into the current themselves, and they danced, hesitant at first, but that space between them turning finally fluid and easy. They swayed and spun, hopped and kicked, until the band folded its music, pulled its instruments apart, and tucked them back into their cases. Marty held Agnes's coat while she reached back and slid her arms into the sleeves, and Agnes, her eyes sharp and clear, smiled. Once outside, Agnes said she'd had a nice time after all, that she'd see him Monday at school. Marty wanted to bottle the frozen breath that puffed out between her lips with each word, save it for summer days when the sun burned and blistered. Frank, again carrying Agnes's shoes on his little finger, whistled his sister over to an idling truck parked across the street. Marty wanted to tell Agnes how he loved the smell of hay and horse in her hair and would watch out for her for the rest of her life if she'd let him. Instead, he blurted, want to go see the fire trucks? What? Agnes asked. Uh, the fire trucks. My pa's a fireman. He's over at the station. Just thought if you ain't never been on a fire truck before, maybe you might wanna, I don't know, get on one tonight. Agnes hesitated. Frank whistled again. But my brother's driving me home. I live, Pa can drive you home. He wouldn't mind. Closter ain't that far. Come on, Aggie, let's go, Frank yelled. Agnes wiped her mitten beneath her nose and sighed. Oh, just a minute, she said and then ran across the street. Her arms swung back and forth in large arcs as she ran, and Marty believed that she actually took flight, lifted off the ground, her red curls suspended in the air. He didn't hold her hand as they walked the two blocks to the fire station. Something inside him warned that he might spoil everything if he pushed his luck, so he was content to walk alongside, occasionally bumping shoulders. He smiled as she stepped up on the running board of pumper number one and then sat tall in the driver's seat while he imitated a siren wail. He laughed as she squealed her way down the pole from the sleeping quarters upstairs, her knuckles white and a bright spark in her eyes. And he felt a small fire warm his heart when she cocked the metal helmet on her head and turned to look at herself in the mirror, the name Schultz 
in yellow letters painted on the back of her crown. So yeah, a little bit of George's ballroom, a little bit of Kaltz's corner. Um, some of the other stories uh, you'll you'll recognize uh, the Glockenspiel shows up in there, and uh, name dropping uh, Kaiserhof too. Um, and uh, so it's you know it's not really a uh, a nonfiction history of New Ulm, but um, it, I like to think it's kind of preserving some of the some of the flavor of this of this area. I mean, this is where I grew up. Um, you know, my family is all from here, and um, it I meant it as kind of a love letter, I guess, to the, to the whole area, and I hope it comes across that way. Um, I have uh, one last um, excerpt that I'm going to read for you tonight. Um, one thing I will say, too, um, a question I get asked quite a bit and, um, is where we came up with the title, The Winter Bees. Um, it was tough because when you've got a collection of 10 stories, to try to find a title that captures all 10 of them, uh, you know, it's, it's an uphill battle. Um, but what my editor and I did is, my editor, by the way, is Nicole Helgett, who some of you might know too from, from Sleepy Eye. She's quite well known. Um, she and I sat down and we made a list of themes from the stories. And so we came up with uh, winter showed up quite a bit. Um, a lot of my stories are set in the winter. And, it's not too surprising because that's when I'm most productive uh, with my writing stuff because I don't have lawns to mow um, or shrubs to clear or whatever. Um, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in the house, so what else am I going to do? Watch Netflix and write. So um, a lot of my stories are set in the winter. Another theme that came up was um, duty, sense of duty, um, restraint, um, love, of course, heartbreak, um, heartache, um, bees and honey. And the color blue showed up uh, quite a bit in my stories too. So we had all these words, all these themes, and we just kind of played with arranging them different ways to see if anything sounded like a good title. Um, at one point, we thought we'd hit on a good, good title. Um, because like I said, blue shows up and bees show up, we thought the blue bees. Okay, that might not be so bad. But then I started saying it out loud and faster, and then it was blue bees. Boobies, boobies. That's, yeah. And I didn't want, I didn't want to be, you know, on TV or something. Uh, here's my book, the boobies. The, so that got tossed out the out the window. So we settled on the winter bees, and once we um, came up with that title, it just seemed to fit, because I like to think of this community as a hive. Um, this fictionalized New Alm is a hive. All the characters in it as kind of the worker bees working together to keep the keep the place humming. Um, and with all of these characters, there's a great sense of duty. These are hardworking blue collar folks um, who put um, the good of the community before themselves. Um, these aren't flashy people, characters. Uh, they don't expect anything. Um, they just do the work that needs to be done to keep the machine humming. Um, and so once we had that title, it's like, yep, yeah, yeah, that's the title. So that's where that comes from. And there are actually um, bees called winter bees. Um, I'm not a big bee expert by any means, but apparently there are bees that have a special enzyme in them. And um, during the winter, if the hive starts running out of their food source, these bees can create food and then feed the other bees. Um, so they kind of give themselves um, over to the hive you know, for, the, for the good of the community. So I need to look into that a little bit more because I think that's fascinating. All right, one last excerpt. And this is from a story called The Humming Bee. Seemed like a good one to end on. Um, and I'm just going to start right from the beginning. The first paragraph in this story is italicized, just to kind of set it apart. I mean, you don't know that when I'm speaking, but um, on the page it's italicized as uh, a little bit of an introduction, I guess. The keeper had told them at the beginning of the summer that he needed a favor. He had a friend who was sick inside, tired through her bones. Because the man was kind, the bees had obliged, spent most of their short lives gathering nectar from the clover blooming white along the Minnesota River. 
Joe Portner stood on the sidewalk, hands fidgeting inside his baggy pants pockets, while Shirley flipped the clothes sign to open and yanked at the bookstore door. Although the sun had already been awake for hours, it just now rolled over the tops of the buildings across the street and stretched into Shirley's shop. Morning, Joe mumbled. He smiled her his yellow teeth and nodded. Shirley squinted into the light. Hello, Joe, how are you? She asked. Good, good, got paid yesterday, so I gotta take a look at those books, those books I got on hold. A lot of them, I'm sure there's a lot of them. He shuffled in, followed Shirley to the counter through a maze of tightly spaced bookcases and jutting display tables. The hardwood floor groaned with each step they took. Shirley lifted a stack of books from beneath the counter, a rubber band tight around the pile. I don't know, Joe, she said, raising her eyebrows. I think I'm going to have to start charging you a hold fee pretty soon. What do you think of that? Joe grinned. Oh, I'm going to buy them. Just a couple today, though. He touched the spines lightly with his index finger as if he were afraid of breaking them open, the pages spilling out like milkweed seeds. This one here for sure, for sure this one. Probably this one too for sure. His lips twitched. Wash my hands today. This morning I washed them, washed them before I came in here for sure. He held up his palms for Shirley to see, fingers splayed. Three times a week, Joe wandered into the bookstore and spent hours carefully turning pages, mumbling to himself. Always books about bees, honeybees in particular. Joe worked down at the railroad, had for more than 40 years, a hard-working grunt who wore his body odor and the grease and oil of the engines like a second set of overalls. Shirley had called him on it once, mentioned that he might want to shower more often, that it'd be healthier for him and a bit easier on her nose. But sometimes he forgot. And on those days, Shirley just leaned back a little farther and kept him close to the open door. How much for this one and this one? These two, how much? Shirley adjusted her bifocals, figured in her head, and gave Joe a number. $36 plus tax. The time was only shortly after 9 o'clock, but humidity already thickened the air. Shirley could feel the covers of the paperbacks arching. Smell Joe ripening in the heat. He asked her when she'd be getting in some beekeeping magazines, and she gave him her usual answer. Well, we'll see what we can do, Joe. He asked every time he came in, and Shirley didn't know whether he forgot during those days between visits or whether he believed that on one special day she'd say, just got this month's issue in today, Joe, and it's a fat one. Most likely he asked because it was part of the routine. Shirley had tried to get him to talk about himself over the years, not the bookstore Joe, but the railroad Joe the frozen TV dinner Joe she imagined, who holed himself up in his one-room house in Goose Town, every wall and level surface covered in books. But he never strayed from protocol. Rumors said Joe was one of the richest men in town. Adopted by late-in-life parents Delmar and Catherine Portner, young Joe supposedly received a fine settlement after the car crash that killed them both. That in addition to the pay he earned at the railroad and the money folks said the Portners had squirreled away early, knowing the challenges their beloved but slow son would face once they were gone, had set Joe well. I'll get those other ones there, those other ones next week, Joe said. If you could just hold them, could you just hold them for me? I'll get those next week for sure. He nodded and held his hand up in goodbye. Shirley put the remaining stack beneath the counter and gathered up an armful of magazines to shelve. Joe's smell lingered like a party guest who had overstayed his welcome, and Shirley did her best to sigh and yawn and convince it to leave, all without much effect. She crouched by the magazine rack, pulled last month's issues, and tucked the new glossy covers in. Fifteen ways to tell him it's over. Are your breasts as healthy as they could be? Why happiness may lie in your man's shoe size. 
Shirley clucked her tongue and turned to page 76. Happiness in the size of a man's foot, she thought. Her mother had always told her to watch for the size of a man's nose. The bigger the nose, her mother had said, the bigger the schwanz. <laughs> Shirley's late husband, Art, had had a strong Roman nose, and Shirley had had no complaints. <coughs> They'd met in 1960 in Shirley's hometown of Mankato, 30 miles south of New Ulm, both freshmen at Mankato State College. Shirley caught Art Reichman's eye as she crossed the campus square in her starched nurse's cap. Art snagged her heart and won her hand in marriage with his poetry. Although she never finished her degree, the sight of others' blood often made her nauseous, Art did. And after accepting a teaching job at New Alms Public High School, he and his bride moved next door to his parents. The bookstore, a shared dream of Shirley and Arts, came later when the children did not. Funny, though she couldn't hear Art's voice anymore, she still heard the odd sounds he had made deep in dreams, his sigh after each sip of morning coffee. He hadn't really gone anywhere, she told herself, so it never was about missing him. The store was full of covers he had touched, pages he had breathed in, words he had rolled over and under his tongue like candy. The house, too, felt full. Sound construction had kept art from stealing out around drafty sills and rotting door jams. Each night, Shirley still felt her husband's arms around her in bed but she couldn't touch him back. And sometimes in those quiet spaces before sleep, when her body finally yielded under the weight of arthritis and the long hours of light, that loss hurt her most of all. People truly will believe anything, Shirley said out loud, shaking her head. Her knees cracked as she stood up. The sound of her joints didn't frighten her, but the fast-moving blackness racing inward from the outer edges of her eyes did. The bookshelves, racks, and tables rapidly spun down a drain, and before she could throw out a hand to steady herself, before the words, I'm going to faint, could jump off her lips, Shirley's store vanished into black without so much as a gurgle. Thank you. Oh, how's that for a cliffhanger? <laughs> Love those teasers. Um, does anyone have any questions, um, anything they're wondering about, about the book or writing process or, or anything really? I'm open to questions if anyone has any. Who are your inspirations? Who are you, who do you, had you read in the past and you said, I get it that? Mm. Um, I have two authors that I adore and would follow them anywhere. Um, Elizabeth Strout, the author of Olive Kittredge. Um, she is a phenomenal writer and she does, uh, you know, I tried to kind of copy what she did where she has these, these beautifully written lyrical um, short stories but they all connect. And um, that's kind of what I was going for with this. She does it better than I do, but that's kind of what I was going for was that, that interconnectedness. Um, so Elizabeth Strout is, is a wonder. And the, the other top author for me is uh, Kent Hariff. And he wrote uh, Plain Song, Eventide, um, and just a, a beautiful Our Souls at Night, which is just a little novella. It's just, it's deceptively simple writing, his stuff, you know. It's, it's different than uh, Elizabeth, who's, who's got very poetic, lyrical language with lots of figurative language. Um, but Kent just has this spare way of, of telling a story that just, I mean, there's so much more behind it than what you're actually seeing on the page. So, so those two are my, are my favorites, yeah. Anything else? How difficult is it to get published? <laughs> well, this was a this was a twenty year labor of love. Um, you know, number one, it, it it took me a long time to come up with the collection in the first place. I mean, I haven't been shopping this for twenty years, but um, 
I've got a full-time editing job over in Mankato. I've, I've um, worked as a children's book editor at Capstone for the last 14 years and before that um, at the creative company. And the nature of that job, I mean, it requires so much creativity um, at work. Uh, I'm writing, I'm rewriting, I'm writing catalog copy, I'm doing metadata. Um, and so by the time I get home, my creative juice is gone and uh, it's like sit on the couch, Netflix. Um, so my writing gets kind of pushed off to holidays, um, maybe weekends, um, or sometimes I'll just take vacation and go on a retreat down to Red Wing. Uh, there's a place down there called the Anderson Center that I adore. Um, and so when you've only got those little chunks of time to write, it takes a hell of a long time to, to come up with 10 stories. Um, once I had all 10, I started shopping it around probably about Oh, I want to say three, four years ago is when I first started shopping it around. Um, and last spring, um, a new press in Mankato, Minneopa Valley Press, came into existence. It's uh, Brian and Deborah Fors and Nicole Helgut. The three of them went in and, and created this company. And they were looking for um, lyrical writing about rural Minnesota. <laughs> Well, there you go. Um, so they wanted character-driven stories, yes. Um, and uh, they just, they wanted uh, language that, you know, that, that spoke to the people and um, really defined the land. And so I, I sent the, the thing in to them and um, got a response right away that they said, oh my gosh, we love this. And um, so the day before I was supposed to go on an Ireland trip, last fall, I got the notice that they were accepting it. So there's always been a little Irish tie for me with this book. It's like the little luck of the Irish. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I got the, the call, well, the, the email last fall. And so it's, it's been a year then to, to get the thing uh, formatted and proofed multiple times and edited multiple times and um, out in the world. So it was, like I said, it was just released two weeks ago. So yeah. I got really lucky with Nicole. Um, she asked me right from the start, she said, you know, how much have these stories been edited before? And I said, well, you know, the large majority of them have been through multiple creative writing classes at MSU. Um, I'm, I'm part of a core writing group, and so I would share my, my work with them and get feedback. And so I said, um, pretty extensive, you know, I don't really want to dick with it too much. Um, and so she, she understood that and she went through it with a pretty light hand. And rather than doing, you know, extensive like line edit stuff, she would just throw in an occasional question or just a little prompt once in a while saying more backstory. And that was it. And that was just the, the, the direction that I needed. It gave me the chance to kind of dig into some of that history. Um, you know, I'm a poet at heart, and so economy is really my thing. And she had to kind of pull me sometimes and say, you need more here. You need more, more to bring the story to life than what you have. It's beautiful language, but you need a little more story there. And so those types of edits just uh, were a great help for me. Anything else? I got one. Yes. Was it difficult to go from the children's book to this book? Not really. Um, the thing is, when you start with poetry as your first, um, the first thing that you love to write, it seems to me anyway, like the kids' books and the short stories, it was an organic thing. I mean, um, with poetry, each word means so much. You know, it carries so much weight. And in kids' books, you only have a certain word count or a certain number of pages. You know, you're also limited by language, but um, there's that, the, you know, the conciseness that you need. And so going in the kids' books, that felt very natural. And then the same thing with the short stories. You know, to me, it's just an extended poem, really. Um, I've been asked if I'd, I've ever tried writing a novel or if I have any ambitions to write a novel. And honestly, all that space scares the hell out of me. Um, I, I, it's just too much room, and um, I, I don't like going on for pages and pages of description. I want to get to the core of stuff and just, and just focus on that. So, I mean, never say never. Who am I kidding? I, 
you know, I may at some point try a novel, but I don't know. I just I feel most comfortable in the in the short fiction and poetry area. And the kid stuff, I, I would like to come back to that again at some point too. Um, it was a fantastic run, and the best part of the kids' book stuff was visiting the the schools and uh, you know doing the visits to the classrooms and. Um, there was so much responsibility uh, with writing the kids' stuff because, you know, this is how they're introduced to literature and reading. And, and um, you know, I wanted to make great readers out of all these kids I was visiting. So, you know, self-imposed pressure. Um, but that was the best part. And then to, to see them light up about a book in, in this day and age of, you know, all kinds of electronic media. To get excited about a book, that's pretty cool. So I, I did love it, and um, the kids' books were very good to me. But uh, it just kind of felt like it was time to go back to, to what I went to school for and, and what I loved most. So. Yeah. Uh, you said that you are an editor at Capstone still. Yep. What kind of children's books are you looking for? Oh, um, Capstone does um, anything from toddler board books to um, like middle grade or uh, early high school, seventh grade stuff. Um, the stuff that I edit is primarily illustrated uh, K to three and uh, fiction and nonfiction, uh, sometimes chapter books. Um, I prefer doing the nonfiction stuff, uh, editing the nonfiction stuff over the... They do yeah, they do fiction and nonfiction, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. one, one problem that I have is I illustrate what I've written, hmm. and I've always been told that that's not the protocol. Yeah, we, yeah. Um, you know, I don't deal too much with um, submissions anymore. I mean, I did when I first started there, but um, that is one thing that we encourage people who are sending in stories not to do. You know, don't send your artwork in with your work. If you're very tied to your artwork, I would suggest you know doing the self-publish route. It's um, it's gotten a lot more acceptable, um, even just from the time I started at Capstone. You know, 14 years ago, self-publishing was still kind of like mm, you know I don't know, but um, it's come a long way, and there's been great success stories of people who have done it. So if you're you know super f tied to it, um, it's going to be tougher to to find a a publisher to do that. So who would you get uh, a hold of at Capstone? Um, let's see. If you wanted to um, submit a query letter, um, if, you, um, if you have a story idea, you might put that in the letter. And you could probably send it to um, the editorial director. Uh, his name is Nick Healy, H-E-A-L-Y. There are um, ten short stories in this in this collection. Yep. Okay. Just wondering. I mean, they, never mind. Yep. <laughs> you answered my question. Maybe. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then I um, I did bring some kids books along too tonight um, in case anyone is interested in picking up some Christmas gifts. Um, Farmer Cap and Henry Shortbull are sadly out of print, and um, so if you are interested, I you know would recommend picking one up here because otherwise you're gonna have to go to a reseller. Or pick up an ebook, which is just not as fun as uh, getting a print book. Um, and then, of course, I've also got copies of uh, Winter Bees here as well, and I'll be happy to sign them for you. Yes? What was your reaction to the Sunday Tribune review of your 10 short stories? Oh, man. I'm trying to remember now what uh, there was one comment about what the language or your choice, your diction, ah. trying, to trying to capture the uh, conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, oh, that was, um, Personally, I thought it was pretty good. that review was just, um, was magic. That was way more than I could have ever hoped for. Um, you know, I, I, I took issue with including the German words. You know, I still stand by that because I feel like it gives the stories flavor and, and that's just part of this, this area. Um, I, to me, it's no different than, you know, Louise Erd, I'm not comparing myself directly to Louise Erdrich, but, it's like Louise Erdrich using uh, Native American language in her stories. I, I think it just gives it flavor, gives it authenticity. So you know, I took issue with that. But um, oh my gosh, the quote about um, 
not questioning Jill's reading of the heart or something. It was like, oh my gosh, guy, this is amazing. So, and then the photo they picked too. I don't know if, um, how many of you saw it, but the photo that um, the Star Trib included with the, the review was of Center Street Hill and a little bit of uh, MLC up on top. And they didn't know this, of course, when they used that, but I grew up right at the foot of that hill. I mean, the first 18 years of my life were at the foot of that hill. There's my dad here, by the way. In case you, have, in case you didn't know, my dad is here today. Um, and the book is actually dedicated to my dad and my mom, who, who couldn't be here tonight. But um, yeah, I grew up at the, at the base of that hill, and I would climb Center Street um, to get to my piano lessons up at MLC all the time. So. So it's kind of cool that they, and then there was a bus in there, and my dad drove school buses, a retirement job. So it's like, oh my God, you guys, it's like you're channeling something here. But so that, no, that was an amazing review. And, and actually, I lucked out with some pretty great quotes too from uh, Will Weaver and Nicholas Butler. So I, it's, been, it's been incredibly humbling, really, you know. And every event that I've done so far, I, at some point, I always wind up tearing up. And, it, it, it truly is a dream come true, you know, a 20-year dream, so. This goes back to uh, the Farmer John, or what's, what's the name of it? Farmer Cap. Farmer Cap. Yes. Okay. How did you find an illustrator for that? That's based on what we've done over, right? Mm -hmm. So did you just write the text and someone else find the illustrator for it? So, how did you do that? yep. So I lucked out quite a bit with my kids' books. I mean, um, my um, journey is not typical. I was actually editing at Capstone when I wrote the book, and so I had a little bit of input into how the illustrations were gonna look. Um, our design department is, they have the final say, and they deal with um, freelance uh, agencies here in the States, and a lot of them are overseas, actually, and so, when they get stories in, they're the ones that kind of go through it and go, you know, this, would, this style would work really good with this story, blah, blah, blah. And then there's collaboration with the editor or whatever. Um, so I had a little bit of an in that way. So when they showed it to me and they said, what do you think of this illustrator? I'm like, mm, yeah, that's the one. And I was able to kind of funnel him some pictures of Whoopi John and uh, Redwood Falls and um, kind of give him some direction that way. But, most of the time, yeah, as a writer, you, you don't really have much say in, in what illustrator a company picks for you. All right. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Seriously, this was like a great way to, to kick off things after the release last week. So appreciate you all coming tonight. And again, I, I will have some books for sale, and I can sign them for you if you'd like. So have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.